All right, everyone, welcome to this section here. We're going to be talking about how to identify your board level components. This is the advanced section. Um, in the earlier sections of your training so far, we've covered high level components such as your LCD screens, ringtone buzzers, things of that nature. Here, we're actually going to be getting into a um, lot more detail. We're going to be actually discussing your logic board and a lot of the components that actually make up how it functions and what they do. So here's a typical picture of, of a logic board. This one actually tends, this is a iPhone 3G specifically. Um, and as you can see, uh, you have some IC packages on there. There's some different connector styles. Um, you have a SIM card uh, connector as well. Um, there's capacitors, resistors, inductors, all sorts of different board level stuff. And you might not be familiar with all of it. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing right now is getting into the specifics here. But what I want you to do is just to kind of get an overall view of what the board looks like. Most boards, they are going to look a little different, but there's going to be a lot of similarities between them. All logic boards pretty much have these same similar components. There's going to be some differences, obviously, in the design, but typically they're all going to be the same sort of way. So we're going to start at the easy one to understand, which is the SMD connectors. First of all, let me explain what SMD is. You're going to see me hear me say two terms interchangeably, SMD and SMT. And basically, they mean the same thing. SMT is surface mount technology. SMD means surface mount devices, where in a lot of maybe game consoles or older devices, most of the components are actually soldered to the board through holes. It's called keyhole soldering. But now because of advancements in technology and the size that everything is becoming, everything now is moving to SMT, surface mount technology, where you know, you're not passing things through the board to solder. It's actually soldered to the top, surface mounted. So SMD connectors, basically what these are used for is to allow your peripherals to plug into the logic board. So you're going to see most of your flex cable connectors, LCD connectors. Sometimes you'll have uh, other daughter boards that are connected on flexes, such as uh, volume control flexes, things like that. They're typically going to be connected using an SMD connector like what you see here. There are some other styles that aren't pictured, but once you kind of see one and you understand what its function is, they, they're all going to be pretty much the same. You'll be able to identify them without any problems. So there's two really common styles of connectors. We have snap and flex connectors, and they either come male or female, and you have a latch style connector, which obviously has a latch on it that holds the cable in place. Um, these are pretty easy to notice when they're damaged. Um, you can sometimes do it with your naked eye. Otherwise, you do have to take them underneath the microscope to kind of see some of the pins. They are very prone to corrosion when they're exposed to liquid. And a lot of times what can happen is when you're doing your liquid damage treatment, if you do a microscopic inspection on it, you'll see that some pins are blacked out or that uh, some of the copper is actually oxidized away to the point to where you can't pass electricity through that connection anymore. Another thing to note with these SMD connectors is they are very brittle. So you want to make sure that you handle them very gently so you don't damage. They can be kind of a pain to, to replace and solder if you have to do that. Um, and in some cases, you don't have a choice. But what you don't want to do is cause yourself more work because you broke a latch off of a, you know, a, a connector on the board. And now you have to go back and figure out how to solder that on when that was something that uh, if you had just been a little bit more careful and taking your time, you probably could have avoided. Um, SMD resistors. So these are two typical styles that you'll see. Um, you have the unmarked type and you have the printed value. And we'll kind of get into these right now as well. Um, standard tolerance surface mount technology resistors are marked with a three digit code in which the first two digits are the first two significant digits of the value and the third digit is the power of 10, the number zero. So for example, if you see a resistor that has 334 on it, that means 33 times 10,000, which is four zeros, is 330k ohms. Same if you see 222, it's going to be 22 plus two zeros gives you 2.2k ohms. So there's a couple more examples for you there as well. We're not going to get caught up too much in the specifics because um, a lot of times in order for you to correctly identify these things, you do have to have the schematics, which can be very difficult to come across. Um, so just a couple of key things I want to point out to you. Resistances less than 100 ohms are typically written on these style. Um, and the final zero represents the 10 to the power of zero, which is one. So if you see one that has 100 on it, Right? That actually means 1, 0 times 1, which is only 10 ohms. And where you're going to see these printed resistors, for the most part, are going to be in larger devices such as gaming consoles. You're not really going to see these too often in cell phones just because of the size of the logic boards. Um, resistances less than 10 ohms have an R symbol to indicate the position of the decimal point, or what's known as the radix point. So another example for you, if you see one that's printed with 4R7, that means 4.7 
where r represents your decimal point, so that's 4.7 ohms. Or 0r22 would be 0 0.22 ohms. And obviously 0r01 would be 0 0.01 ohms. So I think you kind of get an understanding there of, of the printer resistor. Um, precision resistors, usually are going to have one extra digit. You notice on the other ones we only have three digits. Precision resistors are going to have four digit codes in which the first three digits are the significant figures and the fourth is the power of 10. So same sort of examples as we went over earlier. I'm not going to bore you with all the details here. Something that is important to note to you is when you see some that have triple zero or quadruple zero, you'll see these sometimes they appear as values on the surface mounted zero ohm. Basically, there's just a link. A lot of times manufacturers use logic board design between more than one device. So instead of coming up with different boards and different trace styles, they'll actually just use links which are zero ohm resistors and they'll solder them to the surface as opposed to having to redesign the whole logic board. So do keep your eye out for those sometimes because it's basically just like a wire connecting the two, the two connections. Now we get into unprinted resistors. You're going to see these quite often in cell phones. Uh, SMD resistors often do not have any printed numerical resistance value on them and are left blank simply because they're too small to print on. Uh, many times the only way to identify the correct resistance value is to refer to a schematic like we kind of discussed earlier. Or you could check its value by using the resistance setting on your multimeter. In cell phones, resistors are typically black in color and this is something that I definitely want you to pay attention to. I'm going to say it again. In cell phones, resistors are typically black in color. Okay, so remember that because as we get into some other devices, we're going to see some other colors. So I want you to start understanding and being able to distinguish the difference. So now we're into SMD capacitors. And here's a few different style packages for you that you can kind of see. These are very, very common on cell phones. A capacitor stores a charge in an electrical circuit and supplies it back when required. It actually functions a lot like a battery, but it charges and discharges much more efficiently and quickly. Now granted, batteries do tend to store much more charge. They tend to store a lot more voltage. Um, tantalum capacitors are the typical SMD choice in smaller electronic devices such as cell phones. And they're called tantalum capacitors because of the type of powder it's a tantalum powder that they use to actually construct them. So once that's said, there's actually two different types of capacitors, or what are commonly called CAPs for short, that are going to be used in cell phone circuitry. We have polarized capacitors, and we have non-polarized capacitors. You can kind of see from the image here on the right, uh, that's uh, an individual's thumb with the capacitor on. You can see how small these things can get. And actually, they get quite a bit smaller than that. Some of them are the size of a grain of sand. So tantalum capacitors that are polarized and used in DC circuitry typically have values that are going to range from 0.1 microfarads to about 470 microfarads. Standard tantalum values change in multiples of 10, 22, 33, and 47. And normal temperature coefficients for tantalum capacitors is plus or minus 5%. Uh, polarized caps are typically used in large voltage situations, such as DC line filtering to reduce noise related to uneven voltage levels after rectification from an AC source. And they're usually going to be measured in microfarads. Polarity is critical to these devices. They're marked with the voltage rating, which is usually double the circuit voltage used, as well as the farad marking. And that's why they're called uh, polarized, because the polarity is critical to these devices. A non-polarized capacitor or non-polar caps are a type of capacitor that has no implicit polarity. It can be connected either way in a circuit. You'll also sometimes hear people call these bipolar capacitors or bipolar caps because they can be connected in either direction. So here's another tip I want you to point out to. In cell phones, capacitors are typically brown in color. So now we remember, resistors are typically black, capacitors are typically brown. Because other than that, they look almost identical. All right. SMD transistors. So a transistor is a semiconductor device used to amplify and switch electronic signals. It is made of solid piece of semiconductor material with at least three terminals for connection to an external circuit. Its main functionality is to control the flow of current through a circuit. And actually the transistor is the building block of all modern day electronics. A voltage or current is applied to one pair of the transistor's terminals and it changes the current flowing through another pair of the terminals. Because the controlled or the output power can be much more than the controlling input power, the transistor provides amplification of a signal as well. Some transistors are packaged individually, but many more are found embedded in integrated circuits. In modern cell phones, most transistors are actually used inside of IC chips. And like we stated, the transistor is the fundamental building block of modern electronic devices. Most of your main processing units are going to be comprised of millions 
of microscopic transistors inside of the material that they're manufactured from. So there's two different types of standard transistors, NPN and PNP. With different circuit symbols if you're looking at a schematic, the letter refers to the layers of semiconductor material used to make the transistor. Most transistors used today are going to be the NPN style because it's the easiest type to make from silicon. So if you are looking at a schematic, this is typically what the schematic symbols are going to look like. Your NPM style on the left and your PNP style on the right. Not often do we have schematics in the cell phone repair business, so we're just pointing this out to you. You know, well, we're going to try to cover more and more of this sort of stuff for you because sometimes it is available and it's definitely very, very helpful when it is. But this is still good information for you to know. SMD diodes. Here's a few different diode style packages. And this doesn't mean that they're all going to look like this, right? But there's, here's a couple of different styles here. Um, a diode is a two-terminal electronic component that conducts electric current in only one direction. The term usually refers to a semiconductor diode, which is going to be the most common type that we use today. It's a crystal of semiconductor connected to two electrical terminals, which is known as a PN junction. The most common function of a diode is to allow electric current in only one direction, called the diode's forward direction, while blocking current in the opposite direction, which is the, verse, the reverse direction. A diode can be thought of as an electronic version of a check valve. This is, this is unidirectional behavior, it's called rectification, and it's used to convert alternating current to DC, or direct current, and extract modulation from radio signals in radio receivers. Diodes can have more complicated behavior than a simple on-off action due to their complex nonlinear electrical characteristics, which can be tailored by varying the construction of their PN junction. These are going to be exploited in special purpose diodes that perform many different functions such as to regulate voltage, which are Zener diodes, electronically tuned radio and TV receivers, which are Varactor diodes, generate radio frequency oscillations, tunnel diodes, and produce light, light emitting diodes, or what's commonly called LEDs. A Zener diode is a special kind of diode which allows current to flow in the forward direction, same as a normal diode, but it will also permit current to flow in the reverse direction when the voltage is above a certain value known as the breakdown voltage, the Zener knee voltage, or the Zener voltage. Light emitting diodes, or LEDs, um, it's a special type of semiconductor light source. LEDs are used as an indicator lamps in many devices and are increasingly used for other lighting. Early LEDs emitted low intensity red light, but modern versions are available across the visible ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths with very high brightnesses. Photodiodes are intended to sense light, so they're actually photo detectors. So they're packaged in materials that are going to allow light to pass through them. A photodiode is a type of photo detector capable of converting light into either current or voltage, depending on the mode of operation. The common traditional solar cell is used to generate electric solar power in a large photodiode. SMD fuses. Here's a couple of styles. Usually they are going to be marked green, but not always. A fuse interrupts excessive current or blows so that further damage by overheating or fire is prevented. Wiring regulations often define a maximum fuse current rating for particular circuits. Overcurrent protection devices are essential in electrical systems to limit their threats to human life and property damage. Fuses are selected to allow passage of normal currents and of excessive current only for short periods of time. A fuse basically just contains a metal wire or strip that melts when too much current flows through them, which interrupts the circuit in which it is connected. Short circuit, overload, or device failure is often the reason for excessive current. SMD inductors and coils. An inductor or a reactor is a passive electrical component that can store energy in a magnetic field created by the electrical current passing through it. An inductor's ability to store magnetic energy is measured by its inductance in units of Henry's. Typically, an, induct an inductor is a conducting wire shaped as a coil. The loops helping to create a strong magnetic field inside the coil due to Faraday's law of induction. Inductors are one of the basic electronic components used in electronics where current and voltage change with time due to the ability of inductors to delay and reshape alternating currents. Inductors in, in conjunction with capacitors and other components form tuned circuits which can emphasize or filter out specific signal frequencies. Applications range from the use of large inductors and power supplies which in conjunction with filter capacitors remove residual hums known as the mains hum or other fluctuations from the direct current output to small inductance of the ferrite bead or torus installed around a cable to prevent radio frequency interference from being transmitted down the wire. Smaller inductor capacitor combinations provide tuned circuits that are going to be used in radio reception and broadcasting. The number of loops, 
The size of each loop and the material it is wrapped around all affect the inductance of that particular device. For example, the magnetic flux linking these turns can be increased by coiling the conductor around a material with a high permeability such as iron. This can increase the inductance by 2,000 times, although less so at high frequencies. Oscillators An electronic oscillator is an electronic circuit that produces a repetitive electronic signal, often a sine wave or a square wave. An LFO, or low frequency oscillator, is an electronic oscillator that generates an AC waveform at a frequency usually below 20 Hz. This term is typically used in the field of audio synthesizers to distinguish it from an audio frequency oscillator. Oscillators designed to produce a high power AC output from a DC supply are usually called inverters. The waveform generators which are used to generate pure sinusoidal waveforms of fixed amplitude and frequency are called oscillators. And these are typically what they're going to look like on your board. There's a few different chip styles um, for, and they're also called crystals as well, crystal oscillators and VCOs. So we're going to kind of dive into what the difference is here. Crystal oscillators, or crystals, is an electronic circuit that uses the mechanical resonance of a vibrating crystal piece of piezoelectric material to create an electrical signal with a very precise frequency. This frequency is commonly used to keep track of time, such as in quartz wristwatches, to provide a stable clock signal for digital integrated circuits, and to stabilize frequencies for radio transmitters and receivers. The most common type of piezoelectric resonator used is the quartz crystal, so oscillator circuits designed around them were called crystal oscillators. VCOs, or voltage controlled oscillators, is an electronic oscillator designed to be controlled in oscillation frequency by a voltage input. The frequency of oscillation is varied by the applied DC voltage, while modulating signals may also be fed into the VCO to cause the frequency modulation, FM, or phase modulation, PM. A VCO with digital pulse output may similarly have its repetition rate, FSK, PSK, or pulse width modulated, PWM. The biggest thing to understand the difference here is your crystal oscillators are going to be set at a particular frequency based on the material, where a VCO can adjust its frequency based on the input voltage that's used to control it. SMT filters. Electronic filters are electronic circuits which perform signal processing functions, specifically to remove unwanted frequency components from the signal, to enhance wanted ones, or even a combination of both. Electronic filters can be radio frequency and microwave filters, and they represent a class of electronic filter that's designed to operate on signals in the megahertz to the gigahertz frequency ranges, so basically medium frequency to extremely high frequency ranges. This frequency range is the range that's going to be used by most broadcast radio, television, and wireless communication devices such as cell phones, Wi-Fi, etc. And thus, most RF and microwave devices will include some kind of filtering on the signals transmitted or received. Filters are commonly used as building blocks for duplexers and diplexers to combine or separate multiple frequency bands.